Hey guys, this is Golden Radiology High Yield Review for USMLE Step 1. In this video, we'll be discussing adult pulmonology. If you're new to our YouTube channel, our videos focus on high yield radiology images that are likely to show up on Step 1, as well as some non-radiology topics sprinkled here and there. If you'd like to read along and you're a copy of First Aid, we've included associated page numbers in the description below. First question. 30-year-old is incidentally noted to have a congenital mass on chest x-ray. The question asks, the mass most likely arose from abnormal budding of which structure? So the answer here is foregut. This is a bronchogenic cyst, which is a type of foregut duplication. We see a smooth, well-demarcated soft tissue mass arising from the trachea right here. So bronchogenic cysts will typically present just like this. It will be a round, soft tissue mass with sharp borders arising from the trachea, carina, or hyla on either side. These cysts are typically asymptomatic, however, can get infected, in which case they may show an air fluid level as shown here. They can also have a mass effect compressing adjacent airways, which leads to air trapping and respiratory distress. As a reminder, the foregut forms both the proximal alimentary tract, which is essentially the GI system proximal to the ligament of trites, meaning the esophagus, stomach, and proximal duodenum, as well as the lower respiratory tract, meaning the trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, and alveoli. When you have abnormal budding of the foregut, you get what is called a foregut duplication cyst. A type of foregut duplication cysts are bronchogenic cysts. Bronchogenic cysts are foregut duplication cysts arising from the lower respiratory tract. Bronchogenic cysts most commonly occur from the trachea and the large bronchi. You can also have foregut duplication cysts arising from the alimentary tract, most commonly at the esophagus. All right, next question. Sudden collapse two days after hip replacement, and they show us this CT image. Diagnosis? Okay, I think you guys can all get this one. This is a saddle pulmonary embolus. So we're looking at a CTA of the chest, which is most commonly ordered to evaluate for pulmonary embolism. In this study, we time our contrast bolus so that we scan when the contrast is opacifying the pulmonary arteries. For a little anatomy review, this is the main pulmonary artery here, dividing into the right and left pulmonary arteries. Contrast is bright white, so this dark stuff represents clot in the pulmonary arteries. In this case, we have a saddle pulmonary embolus because the clot is sitting right here at the bifurcation into the right and left pulmonary arteries. Here's another pulmonary embolus with a slightly more subtle imaging and clinical presentation. We have shortness of breath, tachycardia, chloritic chest pain two days after hip replacement. Looking at the CT scan, we see a little bit of thrombus right here and here. Rather than call this a saddle pulmonary embolus, this would likely be a lobar or segmental pulmonary embolus. We also see some parenchymal changes here, which likely represent infarcted lung tissue as a result of the PE. Pulmonary embolism leads to hypoxia by causing a VQ mismatch. Q or perfusion decreases while V or ventilation remains the same. Clinical symptoms include sudden onset dyspnea, pleuritic chest pain, tachycardia, and sudden death, particularly in the setting of saddle pulmonary embolism. Risk factors are essentially Virchow's triad and include stasis, such as post-op state, long airplane ride, or long car ride, hypercoagulability, such as being on OCPs, malignancy, antithrombin-3 deficiency, or antiphospholipid syndrome, and endothelial damage, such as smoking or post-operative state. Other types of pulmonary embolism you should be aware of are fat emboli, which can occur in the setting of broken long bones, particularly broken femurs, as well as liposuction. The classic triad will include a petechial rash, which looks like this, neurologic symptoms due to emboli to brain, and hypoxemia. You can also have air emboli, which commonly occur in central line placement, as well as caisson disease, which is also known as the bends due to nitrogen in the blood. You can also have amniotic fluid emboli in the postpartum state. The most common cause of a pulmonary embolism is a deep vein thrombosis, or DVT. Clinically, patients will present with a swollen, erythematous, painful extremity, typically unilateral. The screening test is a D-dimer, which should be elevated. The radiology study is a compression ultrasound, also known as a venous duplex. Normal veins should collapse with compression, as shown here. Here is without compression, and here is with compression. A clotted vein, on the other hand, will not collapse with compression, shown here. We also see this bright clot filling the vein right here. Okay, next question. 72-year-old smoker of chronic shortness of breath. What is the most likely diagnosis? Okay, so this is emphysema. The tip-offs here are an increased anterior to posterior diameter and is flattening of the hemidiaphragms. For reference, the hemidiaphragm should curve superiorly something like this. The most common cause of emphysema is smoking, which will typically be upper lobe predominance. In severe cases of smoking-related emphysema, however, it can involve the entire lung. 
If the question stem mentions panacinar emphysema, which involves the entire lung symmetrically, that is a buzzword for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. The patient may have additional liver dysfunction. On CT, emphysema will present as these focal black areas or radiolucencies, which represent dilatation of the airways as well as alveolar destruction. As a reference, this is a slice of the same patient lower the chest where the lung parenchyma looks a little bit more normal. All right, next question. 68-year-old male, two years of progressive shortness of breath and dry cough. What is the most likely diagnosis? So this one is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. The CT signs here is the classic honeycombing appearance, which most commonly occurs in the lower lobes in the periphery of the lungs, right abutting the pleura. You can also get traction bronchiectasis, where the bronchioles are a little bit dilated, as shown here. Traction bronchiectasis is caused by scarring and fibrosis of the destroyed lung parenchyma, which tugs on the bronchioles and dilates them. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis will have a restricted pattern on PFTs and is associated with a poor prognosis. Okay, next question. 32-year-old African-American female presents with cough, rash, and joint pain. What is the most likely diagnosis? Okay, so this one is sarcoid. The tip-off here is the lymphadenopathy shown here in the mediastinum to the right of the trachea, as well as the bilateral hyla. This is known as the 1-2-3 sign and is a classic appearance for sarcoidosis. You can also have various parenchymal changes in sarcoid, but it's unlikely that they will test on that. Sarcoid is most common in African Americans and has a slight female predominance, so question stems most commonly will have an African American female. Labs may show elevated ACE and calcium levels, and PATH will have non-caseating granulomas. About half of patients will be asymptomatic, and the rest will have various respiratory symptoms such as cough and shortness of breath, and skin symptoms such as erythema nodosum or lupus pernio. The absence of B symptoms can help differentiate from lymphoma, which can also present with mediastinal and hyalur adenopathy. Alright, next question. 42-year-old with chest pain after endoscopy. What is the imaging finding shown here? So this is pneumomediastinum. The clue here is this radiolucent air surrounding the heart, tracking up the mediastinum. You can also see subcutaneous emphysema, or air in the subcutaneous soft tissues, along the neck and along the right lateral chest wall. Subcutaneous emphysema in the neck is commonly associated with pneumomediastinum, so if you see air up here, make sure you look down here. Common causes include iatrogenic, such as endoscopy or being on a ventilator, as well as Borhoff syndrome, trauma, asthma, particularly in children, and a ruptured pulmonary bleb. Note that Mallory Weiss tears are not associated with pneumomediastinum since Mallory Weiss tears are only partial thickness tears of the esophagus. Symptoms include chest pain and shortness of breath, and on exam you may have Hammond's sign, which is crepitus on cardiac auscultation. Alright, I want to review asbestos-related spectrum disease, which confused me a lot as a medical student. First off, we have asbestos, which is the actual material that was used in shipbuilding, roofing, and plumbing historically. Asbestos can cause a number of different clinical entities, some of which are totally benign and some of which are malignant. On the benign side, we have pleural plaques, which are completely asymptomatic, are not pre-malignant. You can also have benign pleural effusions in the setting of asbestos exposure. Asbestosis, on the other hand, is a progressive interstitial fibrosis and will lead to progressive shortness of breath over time. On CT and very advanced cases, it can almost look like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, where you'll have honeycombing and bronchiectasis. The worst of the three entities is mesothelioma, which is a malignant tumor of the pleura that has a very poor prognosis and a life expectancy of just a few years. On imaging, you'll see a diffuse unilateral pleural thickening. This is a good example of pleural plaques. The radiology buzzword for these lesions are calcified continents. That refers to these well-demarcated lesions shown here, 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 which look like little Pangeas, Europe's, and Africa's. These pleural plaques tend to affect the lower lobes predominantly. Mesothelioma, again, is a tumor of the pleura with a very poor prognosis. On imaging, you'll show diffuse unilateral pleural thickening. So here we see this kind of irregular, bumpy pleural thickening along the right. And on the left, we have normal pleural, which shows up as a nearly imperceptible white line along the borders of the lung. A couple key facts to remember. Patients with a history of asbestos exposure still have a much higher risk of bronchogenic carcinoma, such as squamous cell or adenocarcinoma, than a risk of mesothelioma. Also, smoking is not a risk factor for mesothelioma. Another disease related to occupational work exposure is silicosis. This commonly affects sandblasters and those that worked in foundries and mines. Remember, silica is found in the ground and predominantly affects the upper lobes, while asbestos is found at the ceilings and roofs and commonly affects the lower lobes. On PFT, silicosis will also have a restrictive pattern. 
On radiology, silicosis will often present as upper lobe predominant opacities like this, as well as eggshell calcification of the hilar nodes shown here, here, and here. You can also see it on chest x-ray as these increased radio densities at the bilateral hyla. An important association to know is that silicosis increases your risk of tuberculosis. Hope you enjoyed our video. See link below for part two.